What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. With few exceptions, the world now stands as one. The world can therefore seize this opportunity to fulfill the long-held promise of a new world order. We can find meaning and reward by serving some higher purpose than ourselves. A shining purpose, the illumination of a thousand points of light. And that's why I wanted to speak to you today about the new world taking shape around us, about the prospects for a new world order now within our reach. It refers to new ways of working with other nations to deter aggression and to achieve stability. As old threats recede, new threats emerge. The quest for the new world order is in part a challenge to keep the dangers of disorder at bay. The latest now breaking news story now. Syria says Israeli airstrikes on the outskirts of Damascus will make the whole region more dangerous and vowed to do everything possible to protect its citizens. One official said the destruction of the country's military research facility was a declaration of war. Syria's state media says Israeli rockets targeted a military research center on the outskirts of the capital. Video footage and eyewitness accounts suggest that attacks hit weapons dumps, triggering large explosions there. Syria says a number of people were killed and wounded amid widespread destruction. The Arab League has condemned the strikes and demanded the UN Security Council act to stop any more. Follow updates on this developing story in our news bulletins and online at rt.com as well. And stay with us as we have more more news for you after this break. The Syrian Deputy Foreign Minister Faisal al mekdad has called this morning's attack on a Syrian military research facility to quote him a declaration of war by Israel. Because Syria, of course, is a close ally of Iran, and in all likelihood, Iran is now bound to also declare war on Israel. So we're, we're watching this closely. It remains to be seen that at the same time, the Israeli military is still refusing to confirm or deny reports that it is responsible for this morning's attack. Having said said this though, a senior Israeli unnamed source has said that Israel is responsible and that the attack was carried out in the vicinity of Damascus airport. So what's really going on here? Why on earth would Israel do something like this? The first thing to be aware of is that these recent moves against Syria are actually indirect attacks on Iran. Syria and Iran are bound by a mutual defense treaty and any large scale war that breaks out with either one will most likely draw on the other. Likewise, any moves made by Israel can and will be interpreted as a move by the United States. Because if Israel gets involved with a conflict with Iran, the United States will join the fight. This is not just an assumption. On April 17, 2013, the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee voted to endorse Resolution 65, which affirmed that the United States will fully back Israel militarily and financially should it attack Iran. This is very serious considering that Israel has openly indicated its desire to use military force against Iran on numerous occasions. Now this aggression by Israel comes right on the heels of accusations by the U.S. government that the Syrian government had used chemical weapons against its own population, and that this constituted a red line that may justify military intervention. Just days later, the Obama administration mysteriously backed down from these claims and the mainstream media went silent. Now we know why. As it turns out, a UN investigation into the matter revealed that it was actually the NATO-backed rebels which used the sarin gas in the conflict, not the Syrian government. This is more than just an embarrassing mix-up. There's evidence that this event was set up to frame the Syrian government and to create the pretext for US military involvement. In January of this year, leaked documents from a UK-based defense contractor revealed a proposal by Qatar to have the firm provide false evidence that Syria had given the go-ahead for the use of chemical weapons in the country. In the documents, they claimed that the plan had full approval from Washington. If this is in fact what happened, what's shocking here is that in their attempt to frame the Syrian government, NATO has actually facilitated the use of chemical weapons on a civilian population. This is a war crime by any measure. Now, of course, after Syria went public about the airstrikes, Israel was forced to put forth an official justification. And they're now claiming that these attacks targeted a shipment of missiles headed for Hezbollah in Lebanon. 
However, some analysts believe that the real motive was to derail Syria's recent progress in their fight against foreign militants who have been entering the country from Lebanon. Hezbollah, which is the most powerful military force in Lebanon, has sided with President Assad's government in what they say is a war against foreign-backed terrorists. And on May 1st, they indicated that they may directly intervene in the conflict. Russia has also taken the side of the Syrian government, repeatedly calling for an end to external interference and warning that U.S. plans to increase material support to the rebels could have grave consequences. Among these consequences, Russia has specifically indicated the risk of thermonuclear war. China has issued similar warnings. As in most of the major events that we're seeing unfolding right now, the real motives have nothing to do with the official justifications given by the government and the mainstream media. This has nothing to do with protecting the Syrian people. This much should be clear by the simple fact that NATO has backed these insurgents in spite of numerous atrocities and is covering for them now even when they use chemical weapons. What this really comes down to is the fact that Iran is sitting on the world's third largest oil reserves and it's not cooperating with the US and NATO agenda in that region. These attacks all have one goal in mind, to topple Syria and to draw Iran into an open confrontation, which would then give the US and NATO the pretext for an outright invasion. And make no mistake, that's what they want. There will also be many, many side effects, all of them adverse, from an Israeli strike. But at the end of the day, if we don't get it done the way the administration is working on it now, which I totally agree with, then we ought to take them out. Take them your time. <laughs> Well, we're, hey, that's working, a we're that's working a hard. We're working hard. Albert Pike wrote a letter to Mancini, and that was dated August 15, 1871, in which he propagated that there should be a world order, a one order where all nations are under the control of one central organization. And in order to achieve this, they planned, and there are numerous quotes for this, so I've put a number on the screen, because some will say, I don't trust this, I don't trust that, I don't trust the other. Here are references down there. There are references up there. There will be references in other slides, so it comes from different sources. He said, and this was, by the way, on display in the British Museum and could be seen there until it was taken away. 
the First World War to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia, protector of orthodoxy, and bring about an atheistic communist state. Did that happen? Yes. Now that was written long before this event. Long before this event. This was written in 1871. This war broke out in 1914. The Second World War, that's also written long before the event, to originate between Great Britain and Germany, to strengthen communism as, as antithesis to the Judea Christian culture and bring about a Zionist state in Israel. Did it achieve this objective? Yes. In fact, after this war, Israel in its present form was reinstated under the protection of Britain. And then interestingly enough, a third world war, a Middle Eastern war involving, involving Judaism and Islam, and spreading internationally. That's fascinating. Is that uh, on the cards, or what do you think? It certainly sounds like we are on track. Well, here's another quote, uh, just in case people don't like that quote. Massini with Pike developed a plan for three world wars so that eventually every nation would be willing to surrender its national sovereignty to a, to a world government. The first war was to end the Tsarist regime in Russia, the second to allow the Soviet Union to control Europe, the third world war was to be in the Middle East between Muslim and Jews and would result in Armageddon. Interesting. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office. It says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. Uh, the right to a preemptive nuclear strike against China is now part of U.S. law. We've learned that the uh, Korean, North Korean state TV has announced that the North Korea's leader has signed off on a plan to put his rockets on standby for firing at U.S. targets both in the Pacific and right here in the U.S. mainland. Uh, the U.S. government is operating on the assumption that there are 3,000 miles worth of tunnels crisscrossing China, allegedly containing 3,000 nuclear warheads. But I want to go right to the Syria story. Russia putting battleships in Syria, and I think you have reports that they're being joined by China and others. What is going on there? We've got uh, most of America's ballistic submarine fleet operating in the Pacific. Uh, we've also got more U.S. ships moving in that area. The Pentagon all the while promising to contain China and now planning for what they say a possible nuclear strike. Well, that's not exactly going to help or any strained relations, is it? But there is genuine concern over a new missile North Korea unveiled at a parade last year. That road mobile missile uh, would have the capacity to reach the United States. Uh, that's a different type of missile from the one that was tested back in December. Uh, and because it's road mobile, I think that it has raised concerns. Combined air, land and sea involving Russia, Black Sea Fleet elements, Air Assault Division, Spesnaz troops, and Iran, and Syria, and to be joined by China, warships from China. That also includes the very likely uh, scenario where Iran and China have already received permission to pass warships through the Suez Canal. To my knowledge, this is alarming for the whole region, but especially Israel. They're also deploying major combat elements, Larry. I'm told Air Assault Division, Combined Arms D Division, the Marines from the Black Sea Fleet are on their way to Syria right now. This is boots on the ground. There'll be perhaps 400 aircraft involved in 
addition, specialists, Speznats, GRU units, everybody out there who knows about special forces, this is the Russian equivalent. These are veterans from the Chechen guerrilla war. The scenario they're entertaining is in the event of a NATO intervention from the West or North in Syria. You see they're making it very clear there will be no military option for the United States. So there is no option for the U.S. at all. This is a severe setback for the Obama administration. When and if this military exercise takes place, it is clearly in the face of the Obama administration's negotiations with Iran. Putin has played a very strong card. Mm, all right. Well, now on to the latest news out of Syria. There are reports that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad might be preparing to use chemical weapons in his war-torn country. Both the United States and Western allies have warned the Syrian government that Assad will be, quote, held accountable if his forces use those weapons against the rebels fighting his government. Now, this is also the story being told to the American people, that Syria's stockpile of chemical weapons is dangerous and could be deadly. Sound familiar? Well, if it does, that could be because you heard similar talk a decade ago in the lead-up to war with Iraq. The danger to our country is grave. The danger to our country is growing. The Iraqi regime possesses biological and chemical weapons. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass death. Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. Well, not questioning these assertions and that solid intelligence is regarded today as one of the biggest media fails in history. And yet there's a possibility we're seeing something similar with Syria, that this alleged movement of chemical weapons could mean the West can and should get involved. This was made abundantly clear today as the latest news came out regarding the turmoil in the region. It appears the Syrian government is preparing its biological and chemical weapons. Hillary Clinton gave Syria a warning this morning about the use of chemical weapons. The possible use of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime. The Syrian government is losing its grip on Damascus, and that may be part of the reason why they are preparing their uh, chemical weapons. The data shows um, moving, apparently, these weapons. So does the increased attention to Syria's chemical weapons mean that the West is readying itself for an invasion and building an arsenal of justification? Well, we can't say for sure. One thing, however, is clear. If history serves as an indicator, we might be seeing some military action sooner rather than later. Iran's a very large location. And let's remember one of the other key factors here for everyone, no matter who you are. They are the third largest producer of oil on the planet. So if anything happens to that supply, all resources, all prices go up. So anybody who's considering military action, I don't think fully understands the secondary and tertiary effects of a military action and how bad that would be for everybody. Well, hundreds of U.S. and NATO soldiers reportedly arrive on the border of Syria. Isn't there a danger, though, that um, despite what's happening domestically in Syria, this could actually turn into a regional conflict? Already we've seen five people killed in Lebanon, a Turkish jet shot down recently. While this bickering goes on amongst those uh, world powers, as, it, uh, as they call themselves, is there not a danger of it spreading much further now beyond Syria's borders? Well, if you look at the planning, if you were, if you were in the Pentagon right now, or in any of the top think tanks in the U.S., uh, or even a year ago, the plan is, Bill, the plan is regional destabilization, okay? The, the U.S. Embassy has drawn up plans as far back as early this year and is already organizing plans as far back as April to evacuate 20,000 American citizens from Lebanon and embassy staff and NGO workers, okay? This, this, is, this is really happening, okay? You haven't read about it, but uh, it's on a very good source from in Beirut that is happening. Now, what does that mean? That means they're already planning for the destabilization of Lebanon, Washington. So is this good news for Lebanon? No, it's not. Okay, Patrick, these, just, just briefly these, then, what is the end goal for all of this regional destabilization? What's the main aim here, just briefly, from your point of view? The door is open for an attack on Iran, and that is the precursor to World War III as we know it. It's not something anybody really wants to see, but it seems to me the talk out of Washington and London is that they're looking in that direction. 
So we should all be very concerned about this. Grim prediction and very interesting perspective. Thank you very much indeed. Patrick Hennessy for joining us live there in London. Let's go to speed on a developing story now. Tehran's drafted a bill that would close the crucial global shipping route, the Straits of Hormuz. Now the measures are aimed at shutting the waterway to countries which support a new embargo on Iranian oil. Well, of course, the US has claimed it won't tolerate the commercially vital route being shut down in any shape or form. We know that Washington's deployed minesweepers and other naval vessels there. Wars rarely come as a surprise to those in power. Almost without exception, the period leading up to a physical conflict is marked by economic warfare and strategic maneuvering. In public school, we aren't taught this side of history because public schools are run by the state, and the state has a vested interest in having a population that accepts official explanations without question. Right now, the groundwork is being laid for a war between the United States and a bloc of resistant nations. Among these nations are China, Russia, North Korea, Syria, and Iran. This lead-up is passed unnoticed by most of the population for two reasons. One, the mainstream media and the U.S. government intentionally obscure the geopolitical context of the events unfolding right now. And two, this stage in the conflict is comprised of an array of proxy wars, which will have secondary consequences that can only be anticipated if one has a firm grasp on the strategic importance of the regions in question. Unfortunately, we live in a time when much of the public is incapable of even finding countries like Iran or Syria on a map. The reason that nations wishing to instigate a war make use of proxy wars and other forms of provocation rather than attacking directly is largely psychological. When a government wants to take its people to war, they need the public to be caught by surprise when the situation escalates. It is the shock of an unexpected attack that creates the climate needed for an outright war. And this is only possible when the lead up to the crisis passes undetected. In these past months, we've seen an escalation in the tensions between the United States and North Korea, largely driven by U.S.-led sanctions and a series of military exercises conducted by the U.S. and South Korean militaries. These drills, which have been labeled Full Eagle, simulated U.S. nuclear strikes and rehearsed coordinated attacks on the North. This in itself was an escalation, but the tensions were further heightened by the signing of a new mutual defense treaty between the United States and South Korea that significantly lowers the threshold required for the U.S. to militarily engage North Korea. North Korea poses no real threat to the U.S., but if Pyongyang can be lured into a fight, China will be directly affected. This is no trifling matter considering that China has a mutual defense agreement with North Korea and has enough nuclear weapons to make North America uninhabitable. This particular crisis with Korea is but one of many provocative measures that the U.S. has taken against China in recent years. Others include plans which were released in the NDAA of 2013 to target Chinese military tunnels with nuclear weapons and a general policy of military encirclement in Southeast Asia. But why would the U.S. pick a fight with China? Why would anyone in their right mind provoke a nuclear power like this? The answer to that question is the same answer you'll find when you look into the real causes of the wars in the Middle East, and that's currency. The dollar is the world reserve currency, but more importantly, oil is only sold in US dollars. This petrodollar arrangement has been enforced since the early 70s, and the United States has a track record of toppling any country that attempts to organize against it. The reason for this is simple. The only thing giving the dollar value is the artificial demand created by this monopoly. Once the petrodollar dies, the dollar dies. And when this happens, the world is going to be turned on its head overnight. The United States took down Iraq when it started selling its oil in euros, and it took down Libya when Gaddafi started organizing African countries to set up a gold-based currency called the dinar. These were militarily weak nations with no nuclear weapons. But now China is moving to attack the dollar. And this is a game changer. China, of course, is not announcing its attack as such. Its moves have been quiet and subtle, but the implications are clear. The most recent move came this past month when China and Australia announced that they were going to be moving off the dollar for their bilateral trade. In 2010, China and Russia made the same agreement, followed by China and Japan in 2011, and China and Iran have worked out an arrangement that allows them to bypass the dollar entirely by exchanging Chinese consumer goods for oil. To top it all off, the BRICS nations, which include Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, have just announced in March that they're going to launch a new global development bank which will compete with the IMF and the World Bank. Furthermore, China has been buying up massive quantities of gold and taking steps to internationalize the yuan, leading to speculation that they may be planning to transition to the gold standard. These moves have massive implications. China is chipping away at the dollar piece by piece, but the mainstream media isn't talking about it. The politicians aren't talking about it. And the reason is simple. If the public were to understand the petrodollar, they would understand that there is no war on terrorism. There's only a war for control of the world's financial system. All this talk we're seeing right now of a red line supposedly crossed in Syria is part of the same game. It's a proxy war to provoke Syria's closest ally, Iran. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. 
Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall he had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. But one can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? We can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, 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 this is not a, a either-or proposition. Of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. Tehran's responded to the sanctions with threats to block oil trade through the crucial Strait of Hormuz, leading to a continued deadlock in the Persian Gulf. American warships are also present in the region with a mission to prevent any hindrances of passage. Let's talk to John Reish, a political activist and national officer at the Stop the War Coalition, who's in London to get his uh, thoughts about what we're seeing unfolding in front of our eyes here. Hi there. Um, sanctions are often used by the West, but how effective are they really? They're often criticised, I know. Well, what do you think the US and the EU is really trying to achieve here? Well, I think we have to understand this as a, as a strategic uh, foreign policy problem that the United States has had since the failure of the war in Iraq. The war in Iraq was meant to give them a stable, pro-Western, pro-business base for operations in the Middle East. What it ended up uh, doing is making Iran uh, a greater regional power than it was before. And so they've got to deal with this problem, and this is what the sanctions are about. But the sanctions, as we know in the past, as we know over the case of Iraq indeed, um, were the precursor to war. They were a way of pre preparing public opinion for military conflict. Mm. And therefore they are doubly dangerous in this case. They're economically dangerous in the short term, but as your news report has pointed out, we're looking at now a conflict in the Gulf of Hormuz, which is one of the main arteries of the world economy. It really couldn't get more serious than this. And of course, the uh, other big outcome of this that's not been missed either, we've heard from experts saying that China would be very glad to buy Iran's oil shipments if the EU refuses to. So I guess by pushing for sanctions like this, isn't the US providing an extra energy source for the very global power that's seen as Washington's economic nemesis? Well, this is going to be the difficulty with uh, any military conflicts in this region in years to come. You see, you can look on the Iraq war, you can look on the Afghanistan war as wars conducted by a superpower against very small countries. But the growing differentiation in the world economy, the growing military might of, uh, of China, the recovery of Russia itself, is going to lead to a situation where this is not simply a conflict involving smaller powers in which the big powers want to get their way, but it's going to break up um, any kind of international community, as it's sometimes called, and in which the major powers will be dragged into the conflicts as well. And that's a, a, a qualitatively more serious situation than the ones that we've had even in the past 10 years, and those were serious enough. And of course, the possible economic implications as well. Is it wise, uh, I wonder, uh, to attempt to isolate such a major oil producer during these turbulent economic times that the world's seeing right now? Well, you would think that some element of caution might, uh, might kick in here, that um, I, I just as we're on the brink of discovering that we haven't reached the pit of this recession, that there's liable to be, as I think nearly every economic commentator says at the beginning of the year, uh, a, a very profoundly difficult uh, year for the Eurozone, in which we may see the breakup of, of, of the Euro, in which we're certainly going to see further austerity measures pushed through by the governments in Europe and in other places. You would think that this wasn't exactly the moment to risk further further instability in the world economy. So why no progress on restarting talks about Iran's nuclear program, and this despite the fact that Tehran has made unprecedented concessions? Russia's been suggesting this comprehensive step-by-step -step resolution. What is the stumbling block still at the heart of this stalemate, then, do you think? 
Well, I think the stumbling block is the is the point I made at the beginning of this interview. You see, this isn't this isn't just about nuclear weapons. If it were about nuclear weapons in the Middle East, then uh, the United States would have a, a a bone to pick with Israel, which is the only power in the Middle East which actually possesses uh, nuclear weapons. It's not about that. That's the cause of spelli. But the reason uh, for this continued conflict is because the American administration simply can't live with an Iran which has as much regional power as it has at the moment. You see, the Americans, when they look at the Iranian regime, they see its links with Syria, they see its links with Hamas, they see its links with Hezbollah. And this is a challenge to American power in an absolutely critical, economically critical, geopolitically critical um, area of the globe. And it's that which is the sticking point for the American administration, in my view. And we begin with breaking news as more than 20 embassies and consulates are closing around the world right now. And here at home, increased security measures are now in place. ABC News has learned this morning that the intercepted communications that led to the alert indicate terrorists are planning an attack that is going to be big and, quote, strategically significant. Yesterday, the White House held an hours-long meeting, high-level meeting, with the country's top national security officials to discuss the response to the threat, and we've just learned what went on at that meeting, so let's go straight to John Carl, who is at the White House, and John, it sounds like the national security community is really spooked by this. No doubt about that, Martha. The high-level meetings here at the White House over the weekend are a sign of just how seriously the U.S. is taking this threat. In fact, officials tell us they believe that there are al-Qaeda operatives already in place for this attack in Yemen and possibly in other countries as well. The cause for concern are those intercepted communications from the leadership of the al-Qaeda affiliate in Yemen. One U.S. official telling us, quote, the part that is alarming is the confidence that they showed while communicating and the air of certainty about their plans. The official tells us they even talked about their media plan for after the attacks take place. Now, one of the things that is especially concerning about the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Yemen is that they have developed techniques to evade Western security measures. Specifically, officials are concerned about terrorists carrying surgically implanted bombs. As one U.S. official told us, quote, these are guys who have developed developed the techniques to defeat our detection methods. John, people I've talked to said they don't really know exactly what the target is, even if, even if it's an embassy or consulate. What do you know about that? Th that is exactly right. They've closed those embassies and consulates, uh, uh, Martha, because they are strategically significant and would fit that description. But there is no guarantee that this would be an embassy or a consulate. As a U.S. official told us, we do not know whether they mean an embassy an air base, an aircraft, or trains. Now, we saw last year that with the attack on the consulate in Benghazi, the diplomatic outposts are a possible target. But, Martha, there is no guarantee this time around that the target list is confined to embassies. Fear is a powerful motivator. When faced with imminent death, real or imagined, even the laziest and most out-of-shape couch potatoes find it in them to spread to safety. Fear isn't nearly as effective as desire for tasks that require intelligence, like drawing a picture or writing software. But for low-level fight-or-flight reactions that don't require much reflection, like getting a nation to go to war, for example, fear gets the job done. This state of affairs has never been lost on politicians, dictators, and strategists. They understand that the public, like a flock of sheep, it's often easier to corral in a given direction by having a menacing dog nip at their heels than by trying to sell them on visions of wonderful green grass waiting for them on the other side of the hill.
especially when there clearly is no green grass on the other side of the hill. Of course, it wouldn't do to have the rulers themselves play the role of the dog. If they did, then they would be the ones that ended up feared and distrusted. This works for a while, but it's not stable. Rulers, like shepherds, need others to play that role. They need boogeymen, terrifying enemies lurking in the shadows, right next door or in a distant land, so that the rulers can play the role of the valiant protector, the mommy and daddy that you never outgrow. Don't worry, you don't need to think. Your mommy and daddy, the state, will take care of this. All you have to do is obey. And such fandoms aren't readily available. They're manufactured or blown out of proportion, like an ant turned into a science fiction monster by zooming in with a magnifying glass. The specter of Islamic terrorism is a combination of these two, manufactured and exaggerated. Manufactured? Oh, please. You're not trying to tell me that the United States created Al-Qaeda, are you? Actually, yes, I am saying that. This is a historical fact. It's not even up for debate. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. We funded, armed, and trained Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan the same way that we're currently funding, arming, and training Al-Qaeda in Syria right now, and for the same reasons. Osama bin Laden was literally on the CIA's payroll. We even know his code name, Tim Osman. The documents are declassified. This isn't rocket science, people. This information is easily available to the public if you're willing to do a little of your own research. Let's look at another example. In 1980, the U.S. funded and armed Saddam Hussein to assist in his invasion of Iran. We gave him missile technology, chemical weapons precursors, and biological weapons. The same weapons that he used against the Kurds. The U.S. government knew full well what he was doing, and yet they said nothing. That is, until they needed an excuse to invade 20 years later. That's when it was convenient to build up his boogeyman status, to puff up the American population with a strange mixture of fear and bravado. Fear because there was a big bad man who posed an imminent threat to the American people. Bravado because mommy and daddy were going to take care of the problem with big guns and smart bombs. Don't you worry, we'll take out that evil Saddam. Just sit tight, wave your flags, and don't ask too many questions. Don't mind the civilians dying by the truckload. Don't mind the brutal tortures being perpetrated in Abu Ghraib prison. Don't mind the fact that they used this phantom threat to completely eviscerate the Constitution. Just keep waving your flags and repeat after me. USA! 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 That's right, let's make patriotism about death and destruction. Let's sacrifice our freedoms to protect ourselves against these savages who hate us for our freedoms. Yeah, that's a ticket. I'm proud to be an American, because at least I know I'm free. Of course, this charade has been going on long before America's war of terror. The previous boogeyman was communism, that red menace that was spreading across the globe like cancer. Our only hope was to drop democracy, freedom, and napalm all over the world. When a good excuse to open up a can of democracy on someone didn't exist, we just made one up. The Gulf of Tonkin incident, for example. The attack on the USS Maddox that the United States claimed occurred on August 4, 1964, the attack that was used as the pretext to start the Vietnam War, was completely fabricated. It never happened. The U.S. Navy's own historical website acknowledges this now. These historical facts aren't even a point of controversy or debate at this point, but if you had told the truth back then, you would have been considered an unhinged wingnut, a conspiracy theorist. That was 39 years ago. Those 58,000 Americans that were killed and the hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese that were killed don't matter now, do they? I mean, who cares? This is just history. Water under the bridge. What does it matter that the U.S. government put together detailed plans to blow up one of their own passenger jets over Cuba? A plan explicitly crafted to lay the blame on Castro and to build public support of an invasion. This was called Operation Northwoods. Again, it's declassified. The U.S. government doesn't deny it. Look it up. You can find the full document easily online. But really, why are we even talking about this? Clearly this kind of thing only happened in the early days of the CIA. Now the government has grown out of this. Now the government can be trusted. Right. So why does this matter? Why are we still talking about this? Because it still works. Problem, reaction, solution. Those in power create a problem, stimulate public outrage, and channel it towards a solution that suits their purposes. Whether that be new laws that give them more power, or a war of aggression that they couldn't sell if they told the truth.
On July 27th, just before Friday prayers, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei summoned top Iranian military chiefs for what he called their last war council. Deb Kafal's exclusive sources disclosed that he told the gathering, we will be at war within weeks. Each of the participants was tapped to report on the readiness of his branch or sector for shouldering its contingency missions. Retaliation was high on the agenda, but defense was higher, starting with the biggest fortification project in Iran's history for the protection of its nuclear program. Rocks are being gathered from afar, piled on nuclear installations covered with many tons of poured concrete, and finally plated with steel. The strength and thickness of this armor plating are designed to hold up against U.S. and Israeli aerial and missile bombardment. They would start by announcing enhanced uranium enrichment up to 60%, and that is close to weapons grade. Ballistic missiles would be loosed against Israel, Saudi Arabia, and American Middle East and Gulf military installations. Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas and Jihad Islami in Gaza are to pitch in against Israel. Saudi oil export terminals would be blown up in mines sown in the Strait of Hormuz to impede the export of one-fifth of the world's oil. Khamenei put before his war council a timeline of weeks for the coming conflict September or October. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. Tensions over Japan's military normalization have risen recently for a number of reasons. Japan is making more moves to guard against China's rise, as are other nations, and China is suspicious of containment. North Korea has also spurred Japan to change. NATO leaders agreed on Sunday to implement a new European missile defense shield. The decision was openly defiant toward Russia, which says that the system could be used to stop its own nuclear missiles and therefore would undermine its nuclear deterrent. Joint exercises by Chinese and Russian naval troops ended the fifth day on Thursday with joint escorting, anti-hijacking and live fire drills in the Yellow Sea, just west of the Korean Peninsula. I said, we're going to war with Iraq, why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. All right, well, unemployment dropping, the economy growing, and home prices rising. So why, why is food stamp use surging? And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, he said, I just... He said, I just got this down from upstairs from the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. Well, I mean, a couple of things, but one of them, I think the administration is asking the wrong question. The administration has asked so far, how do we get more people on SNAP benefits? And there's, uh, there's no question that the presence of petroleum throughout the region has sparked great power involvement. Whether that was the specific motivation for the coup or not, I can't tell you, but, but there was definitely, there's always been this attitude that somehow we could intervene and use force in the region.
How do we get to the airbase? I don't know. America? Let me show you what you're doing. Russia to heaven. We lost the airbase. Got pushed back to old. Hold on, boys! A massive buildup is in the works. Thousands of U.S. troops now gearing up to go to Israel. The military is calling it an exercise, not a deployment. But this is one serious exercise. This, as Israel says, they're ready to go to war with Iran. Well, reports are circulating that the U.S. is amassing a greater military presence in the Middle East. The alleged buildup is also rumored to involve the Israeli use of Saudi Arabian airspace. It's thought by some to be in preparation for an attack on Iran.